What we're going to do talk today is talk about an open source project called Aconda, which interfaces with OpenStack and Nginx. Um, to give you an idea of where we're headed today, um, we'll touch a little bit on OpenStack, Neutron, um, Neutron load balancer as a service, Aconda, and then you know really how Nginx and Nginx Plus integrate in with OpenStack. A little bit about me. Um, my name is Mark McLean. I am the co-founder and CTO of Aconda. Um, I'm a member of the OpenStack Technical Committee and was the former Neutron um, OpenStack Networking PTL for a year. So, you know, kind of the level set a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about the basics of OpenStack. I think, you know, really with Cloud Now, it's like the, if you've ever seen a talk on OpenStack, you probably have seen this um, image somewhere. Where it's you know, OpenStack is really a collection of compute, networking, and storage. Um, and from the user standpoint, what they're basically seeing is they're seeing APIs for those, for the compute networking and storage. They're independent of the implementation so that you could have the implementations backed by a number of different technologies, um, including KVM um, for networking. You can have a number of different network plugins and storage. And so within that, um, Neutron itself is what confuses some people when they hear about Neutron or hear both good and bad is like Neutron itself is it's a REST API with logical abstractions so that you know within the networking component in Neutron, you have a network, you have ports, you have subnets. That's basically what Neutron gives you outside of the extension framework. Um, and it's the extension framework which really gives us the ability to leverage and, and integrate Nginx into OpenStack. So the Neutron API can be used to create a number of different rich topologies. This is kind of, you know, one of the other interesting things to kind of point out here is that you can have overlapping IP address ranges across tenants. Um, it's good for um, testing and CI infrastructure. Um, Neutron itself, you know, had several design goals, which is a unified API. That comes really important a little bit later when we start talking about load balancing. Um, having a small core, but at the same time, um, having a pluggable open architecture, which enables being extensible. Um, you know, and so the actual release of Neutron in terms of OpenStack, um, it's on its seventh release. If you look at the companies they're contributing, it's a who's who of companies you would expect to be contributing. Um, you know, it's in production and large scale. Um, but also taking a look at you know, how the pieces fit together. I said it's a pluggable open architecture. You know, we have kind of this nice like, clean picture of what OpenStack is, but sometimes I think it's handy to kind of peek underneath the hood and see how the pieces fit together. Um, and underneath the hood, it's a little messy um, in terms of what the graph looks like. But really, if we kind of dive in, that's, you know, we can kind of really zoom into this is Neutron. This is, this is the components we care about. The rest of it will be compute and storage. Um, another way of viewing it is the reference architecture for, for Neutron is really a um, collection of microservices. You have layer two agent, which runs typically on hypervisors. Um, depending on your networking backend, you may or may not have this. Um, others have similar replacements. Um, you have a layer three agent, you have DHCP agent, and then you have advanced service agents, which will manage and manipulate um, advanced services such as load balancing firewall um, and VPN. The Neutron server itself, if we dive into that box, has a REST API, an RPC service, and a plugin. And then, so, but these are all the frameworks for providing that tenant, um, that generic tenant view into orchestrating the network. Um, and so really, when we, we're going to dive into those last two points, which is being pluggable and extensible, which is how we're able to get load balancing into OpenStack. And so within the, those extensions, um, you're really adding logical resources. You add a load balancer to the API. You can add, you know, um, some of the other common extensions are DHCP, layer three, uh, layer three routing, um, provider, security groups. And then some of the other extensions for security purposes, like allowed address pairs to stop ARP spoofing, extra routes, metering. Um, question usually comes up at times, and you know, this is important also in terms of when load balancing is that Neutron supports a very robust security model in terms of both ingress and egress security groups. It's a little bit different if you're familiar with how AWS uh, security groups work, as well as multiple overlay support protocols so that you can run uh, VXLAN, um, Genev, GRE, tunneling, um, and then one of the newer features in coming out in this fall's release of Liberty is RBAC. So now you can actually share networks across tenants, um, which from a production standpoint is really handy because as a deployer, you can, an operator, you can set up a, a collection of networks and then allocate them specifically to be shared amongst a select group of tenants. Uh, previously, this was super hard to do. And then the OpenStack community has both security team and the vulnerability management team. So, you know, 
OpenStack and Neutron in general allows you to build a number of different network topologies. You can consider both, you know, do you want a layer two network? But most people are building layer three centric networks. Uh, they're easier to manage, easier to operate. Um, you don't run into some of the headaches of having very large L2 domains. Um, as well, and a lot of times they're supported with different types of isolation, GRE, VXLAN, um, Genev. Um, just kind of touch on those a little bit. With VLAN, it's, you know, 802.1Q. Um, it's it requires a lot of setup and you know your underlay has to be aware of how your VLANs are allocated and deployed, um, can really cause some problems. And so a lot of times with Neutron you'll see either very flat deployments or deployments based on VXLAN Geneb because that way you can encapsulate that L2 packet into layer three or four depending on which protocol you're running. And then it's routable within your fabric. You, you can, because IP fabrics just really kind of scale. Um, so, Taking a look at that, you know, that's kind of the basics of what Neutron is. Um, one of the things is that, you know, Neutron itself is just networks, it's ports, it's subnets, not a whole lot of interesting things. And really, when we're deploying applications, we want to, we need interesting, we need, we want to do interesting things. We want to deploy our applications. We need the network to support it with on-demand provisioning. And so part of that within OpenStack is they have what's kind of um, more recently known as the Big Tent, which is the ability to spawn up projects um, within that for, and as long as those projects support open design, open development, open community, and within that, there's kind of even a sub area with that, which is kind of a nickname within the networking area, the Neutron Stadium. And really what that does is it provides a common form, improved consistency, shared governance, um, so that one of the projects that was spun up in there was load balancing as a service. So when we start taking a look at that, um, you know, and what I'll do is I'll kind of walk you through how the logical models kind of work with load balancing a service, and then also kind of where it differentiates a little bit. So, you know, load balancing service, it's tenant provisioned um, load balancer instances, whether logical in, in you know, a software appliance or whether in hardware. Um, you know, there is a new API, the V2 API, um, which was basically officially released in Kilo. Um, the V1 API was kind of an escape prototype that kind of lived a much longer life than it should have. Um, the new API included an updated logical model, which we'll kind of step through. Um, also support for TLS. And so one of the things that a lot of people, when they start looking at Neutron and some of the resources for load balancing, it's just kind of a touch on history. You know, going back six releases, um, load balancing has always been of heavy interest within the OpenStack community. And so making sure that, um, and, and bringing that and delivering it. And so what essentially happened was the experimental API was kind of brushed in and grizzly. And so when I, some of the things I talk about, if you go Google them, unfortunately, some of the top hits are still for the old V1 API. So just kind of a word of um, caution there. But you can kind of see we've had that kind of steady step progression in terms of improving the API. Um, specifically, when we rewrote the V2 API, it was a more collaborative environment from deployers and vendors jointly. Um, so the load balancing service data model is kind of a little bit interesting. It renders well onto the Nginx um, model, but it also has a little bit of terminology differences, so we'll kind of highlight those as we step through. But really, um, you know, the thing to remember about the data model is from the default deployment, it's a least common denominator kind of thing. So you're going to have the basics. If you want to have extras, that's where extensions come into play. That's where you're going to want to deploy a more powerful appliance um, and, and, and really deploy something that enables you to have extra features and access to them. Um, within that model, you have, in, within the Neutron model, you have the load balancer, um, which is a top level object. And really all it does is just holds the uh, VIP port um, in Neutron, and that's the external address available. Um, you can do both um, setups where it's one arm mode, two arm mode, um, you know, so it gives you lots of options there. And it's, you know, the provider that does that. Um, within that container, you have a listener. Uh, which really says, okay, here's what we're listening, what protocol, what port, default. I mean, this is kind of standard stuff, but it's really analogous when you take a look at Nginx of here's the, ser the server line within the file. Um, and then within that, you have the pools, which is kind of more when you start taking a look at like what the back end would be in, say, an Nginx. Comp and so, you know, the back end is where you can choose your session persistence, the algorithm you're using, um, and then declare the member sets. Um, and then the members themselves are kind of fairly lightweight. 
address, port, waiting, subnet, um, but that's kind of in the basics in the open model. And then also as well as just, you know, how you monitor the health of your member set um, in terms of like type, timeout, um, delay, and if it's HTTP specifically, you can say which method to use, which URL, what response codes you expect um, for particular things. Um, and then, so one of the things I touched on is, and it's kind of one of the newer features in the V2, which is cool, is support for uh, TLS. And in order to do that, you have to have a companion project called uh, Barbican, which was created, and this is where the open, the big, the OpenStack Big Tent really helps us all. Um, the Big Tent enables like projects, so you can have load balancing, you can have uh, Barbican, which is really as projects to store, secure, uh, securely store uh, secrets and manage them in, in a very secure way. Uh, one of the things that we were, we were finding early on with some of the V1 implementations is that folks wanted to store secrets and store, but didn't really store them in a provider specific way, but not necessarily the most secure way. Um, they were just kind of trusting that the management network would do what it was supposed to do. Um, you know, and it, it provides pluggable uh, crypto components, um, so you have access to HSMs, you can, it, it's really robust. And so within that, um, what you end up with is you end up uh, with a load balancer as a service um, that's accessible to all tenants. It gives you dynamically provisioned load balancing um, that you can use with the CLI to create. And so that's how the load, that's how load balancer as a service kind of the overview, the high logical um, level view of it. And so as we kind of dive in a little bit deeper, you know, we have the big tent that enables a number of different players. So we've talked about load balancing as a service, we've talked about um, Barbican, and one of those players in the is tent is a conda, which is uh, the company I work for, but we're also an open source project. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of take on a number of Neutron operational challenges. Um, one of the things that's super hard to do is it's, man it's super hard to manage multiple services within, a new within an OpenStack deployment. A lot of times they were written specifically to allow one and only one thing. Uh, but the reality is as deployers, and the condo was born from a deployment perspective, is that, um, you know, because when we founded the project, we were all working for a large hosting company at the time and wanted to make sure that we could manage multiple services, manage uh, multiple levels of deployment as well as have differentiated service and quality of service um, for equivalent um, advanced services. Oops. So, you know, another one of the things that's also interesting is that when we take a look at some of the problems is that SDN landscape, and you have an SDN controller, you have an L2 orchestration system, is that they're very hard to change, especially if they're very, if, if you integrate all your layer three and above services into it. And over time, some of the services get better, some of them don't scale, some of them um, have different scaling curves and you want to switch those out. So that was another one of the reasons that when we were founding the Aconda project, we wanted to have that ability um, we also want to have the ability to have multiple vend um, to better enable multi-vendor deployments. Um, you know, sometimes it's multi-vendor in terms of, you know, solutions from two different vendors. Sometimes it's actually two solutions from the same vendor but different variants depending on cost um, strategy. So within that, we, we founded the Aconda project um, with three core principles of being simple, compatible, and since uh, being born out of a company that really had a strong open source uh, ethos, um, open development was one of our things, and so the project was um, Apache 2 licensed. So, you know, kind of touched on this earlier, this is kind of a slide we've seen before, which is the reference implementation of Neutron. It's the same set of uh, microservices. You know, one of the challenges is keeping them all running, monitoring, um, and so with Aconda, we kind of changed it a little bit and we replaced the layer three and above services with an Aconda service. Um, and really central to that is, a central or, is the orchestration system, um, which is really an escape, pro, which, which has an escape prototype name, which we nicknamed the rug. Um, if you've ever seen the movie, The Big Lebowski, it's a reference to the line where it says the rug really ties the room together. We think a network orchestration is tying the room together. So, Within that, the rug is control plane orchestration. Um, Aconda itself does not sit within the data path. It orchestrates elements that are in the data path. So Aconda can orchestrate Nginx and, and properly wire it within the data path to provide that self um, service for tenants. It's logically centralized, um, has a pluggable driver model, which is the reason we're able to support Nginx pretty rapidly because we could write a driver, we could deploy it. 
Um, as well as from HA and, and availability, you get, it's multi-process and multi-threaded. Um, interesting thing about a condo is it scales both up and out. Um, as a deployer, you can choose to you can choose to increase the size of the processes, number of threads available, or you can run more processes across more across more instances. It's either it's your choice as a deployer. But at the same time, those standard interfaces, which I talked about earlier, um, the rug still honors. Um, main reason for that is you want standard tooling, and you want the clients to be able to use their provisioning systems of, you know, Ansible, Puppet, Chef, go through and use those to deploy. And so that's why we wanted to make sure we met the standard the standard interfaces for Nova, Neutron, Glance, um, and so. The orchestrator itself and the rug is really there. It's reacting to changes in the logical model. Um, so from one side, it's listening to change the logical model, the changes the tenant makes, or maybe the cloud operator may make some changes on behalf of the tenant. Um, and then underneath the hood, it's going to take those, it's going to act on them, it's going to communicate with the layer two, layer three, layer four subsystems to you know, implement those changes in the data path. And then, but a lot of systems kind of stop right there and just turn it on, hope for the best, hope it's good, and then assume that as a tenant, you're monitoring your network function to ensure that it's healthy. Um, what the rug does is the rug continues to monitor that function um, to make sure that it's healthy. If it's not, it's going to auto heal the instance. Um, another one of the things that happens typically is when you have these instances deployed, Sometimes operators may be troubleshooting or may try to go and want to make optimization tweaks and we'll go through and manually change configurations on instances. Um, the rug itself will check for and prevent config drift, um, which is kind of a big problem that we've all kind of encountered. It's like you run a data center long enough and then somebody power cycles a machine and you find out that it had some special config that nobody knew about until you found out the hard way. So, so you know, Taking a look at the, what, what the rug does, you know, it has several advantages. You know, it's the, it's 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 um, multi-vendor. It really allows you to support a multiple mix of vendors, both you know, in the higher level and lower level layers of the network stack. Um, it was designed from IP. It was designed with IPv6. Um, if you're using the routing component, uh, Aconda supports dynamic routing very well, which is in contrast to OpenStack. Um, so you get BGP, OSPF, uh, as well as the fast path, and and that's really the fast path here is how. The Conda team was able to um, set up a uh, Nginx, and so you know today we're looking at you know the Conda project was born in 2012. It's now it's been in production for three years. It's been man it manages you know several thousand network functions in production daily. Um, it's compatible with Juno, Kilo, and the forthcoming Liberty release. It's compatible with a number of different layer two systems. And one of the questions that comes up at times is you know. What does this look like if I'm deploying OpenStack? Um, you have, you know, Nova, Neutron, and Aconda orchestration are all running in the control plane on the left-hand side. If you look over to the right-hand side, um, your network stack is basically your physical network in whichever topology you want. Um, what we've been finding is when people run overlays, run very simple topologies in the physical network because it's really easy to troubleshoot, really easy to expand and and, and manage. And then above that, you have, say, uh, OVS or Linux Bridge, which are managing an overlay system or possibly a proprietary version. Aconda is layer two agnostic, which is important for when you're wiring in network services. And then on top of that, you have the OpenStack APIs, and then you have the Aconda, the Aconda hooks for deploying load balancing firewall and VPN services. And so you get those advanced services at the top. So it's kind of the stack both ways of here's where the control plane is and here's what's actually going on within the data path. One of the other things to contrast for is when you take a look at the Neutron reference architecture is typically the services are all co-located into a network node. Uh, DHCP, routing, uh, firewalls of service are all collapsed down into one of those. And then what you end up having is you have problems where that network node becomes saturated. Yeah, you could deploy more than one, but you still end up with um, single points of failure within your network. You end up with network congestion and very well-known and predictable spots. Um, and so a lot of times it causes lots of issues. So Aconda does a little bit differently. Um, and this is where we can really take, like you can, you can spin up an Nginx appliance and we can spin it up as a VM um, within the OpenStack deployment. We can manage it and we spread out these network functions around the deployment. Um, it gives you the ability you know, in inevitably hardware will fail. Um, so making sure that you mitigate the outages, mitigate the impact of when hardware fails, you know, you hope to catch it ahead of time, but you know, you never know when somebody's 
when your electrician's going to be working in the wrong panel and you know takes down half the data center. Um, you know, I think we've all kind of been there, unfortunately. So, you know, you have that choice, or you know, optionally, you can spin these, you can spin up the you know, Aconda can manage the instances and containers. Um, the Aconda project, just a little real quick. Um, the source is available on GitHub, uh, StackForge. You know, feel free, star it, like it, fork it. Um, we have documentation available for docs.aconda.io. And then, you know, we're always kind of hanging out in Freenode, um, to, you know, ready for questions and whatnot. So, you know, this is Nginx Cough. I work for Conda. Why are we here? Why are we talking about it? And, you know, the interesting thing is when you really dive in is, you know, ultimately, tenants want, you know, self-service Nginx. You talk to application developers at companies, they're like, I love it. I'm happy to write, you know, scripts to manage it, but if I can do it via OpenStack tooling, even better. Um, you know, they want the best performance um, over some of the other options. If you take a look at what the open source op integrations in with OpenStack, they're a little messy. They're a little, you know, some of them don't actually work fully. You know, some of them are half-baked. Some of them are in different processes of getting deployed. Um, you have that simple deployment story, but you also have standard tooling. You can use Heat. You can use Ansible scripts that already understand it. So within, you know, Nginx, um, and so within that, Aconda enables you to deploy Nginx. Very simple provisioning. From an operator standpoint, you can build up a golden image that has Nginx or Nginx Plus. Um, the cool thing is if you're running Nginx Plus, it gives you access to the dashboard. You have access to all the extra analytics and metrics that you wouldn't normally have access to. Um, it's a big differentiator between what you would have, say, with the you know, other open source op you know, options that are currently built in with the reference implementation for load balancing. Um, you know, so between that, it's really easy for the tenant to be like, hey, give me access to my dashboard, um, as well as it's a combination of proven components. Um, it really gives you, you know, where we, it really gives you that integration. So, you know, where we're at today is the load balancing API, if you noticed, um, and the Conda, the version that's available gives you opportunity to get, you know, basic TCP, uh, ACP, um, you know, looking ahead into the Mitaka release, and, and Aconda tracks that as well in terms of how we integrate um, in with Nginx is going to have the ability to, you know, integrate in with Barbican so that we can share, that we can do SSL certificate management appropriately and securely push those to the clients so that you can set up. Um, so. So that kind of gives you a little look ahead um, as far as what's going on broader community in OpenStack and load balancing. Um, currently, right now, the team's been really just kind of hammering on their reference implementation. So the API itself uh, didn't really undergo many changes in Liberty. And right now, there's not too, too many um, proposed for Mitaka. I do expect to see a lot more. Um, so yes. So um, any questions? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, the question is, is the API right now is the standard load balancer API, and what changes will we propose? Um, I think the biggest change I'd like to propose is now that Neutron has the flavor framework, um, it gives you the ability to have differentiated services. But what there's not right now is there's not currently a way like the biggest parallel is, say, like in compute, you have the ability to get a console within your compute node. Um, within the load balancing API, I would love a way in a generic way so that a tenant can say, give me the dashboard for my appliance, give me a console to my appliance in a, ver in a safe and secure operator managed way. Um, you know, having worked formerly for a company that ran a public cloud, having worked for another company that ran a large private cloud internally with public access, you know, the security side of me wants to have a very, a good way to get to it, but also a way that's secure. So that's probably the thing I'd want the most is just versus having to write a one-off extension that you didn't have to educate your customers how to use. Yep. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much.